Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today uh, I'm gonna do something that I haven't, I don't think I've really done with reviews, and that is I'm gonna review three books at once. They're all three novellas, uh, and so I'm gonna be reviewing K.J. Parker's uh, what I call Saloninus trilogy. It's not actually called that. Nowhere on the books does it say that, but there are three books over the course of you know several years, three novellas that star this main character. Saloninus. And so I'm going to call it Saloninus Trilogy. So I'm going to be reviewing all three books, which consist of Blue and Gold, uh, where's the other one? The Devil You Know, and The Big Score, um, in, in that order. Now, <laughs> I don't really understand why, I mean, it has to do with publisher, but still, like why, like these two were published by Subterranean Press, the first and the third one. And so they're like little hardbacks, and I got signed copies and everything. And then you have... This one that's published by Tor, that is this little, this paperback, middle one. So it's weird, but you will see, as you will see in this review, it's actually kind of apropos for the way these books feel. So, without wasting any more time, let's get down to business. Let's go ahead and talk about book one, Blue and Gold. Now, what originally sold me on Blue and Gold, besides the fact that I really like K.J. Parker, is its opening lines. And K.J. Parker is really good at these opening lines that kind of you know, take you off guard and, and, and suck you in. And you're going to see, and I'm going to talk about in this review, kind of the things that K.J. Parker does a lot, the similar elements in K.J. Parker's uh, works. And I'm, it's not going to be spoilers, so I'm going to keep from spoilers as much as I can other than the premise of the books, but it doesn't spoil anything, trust me. There's always a K.J. Parker whoop, turnabout, and I'm not going to talk about any of those, but I will discuss... Uh, the similar elements that appear in not only these three books, but in K.J. Parker's larger body of work. And so this book starts with, well, let me see, I said, as the innkeeper poured me a beer. In the morning, I discovered the secret of changing base metal into gold. In the afternoon, I murdered my wife. And, you know, then it continues with the innkeeper told me that'll be two bits. Like, he doesn't even hear him, which is just standard of Parker. Parker is an exceptional writer in where... The things he writes about are very bleak. Uh, he has a very cynical worldview of humanity, and that's the thing I think Parker does better than better than any author. Really, it shows us, holds a mirror up to the more depraved parts of humanity, the the selfish parts of humanity. But he does it in a you know a kind of jolly way. The writing style is very, it's just kind of very elevated. It feels much more like uh, like a Pratchett or a Bancroft writing style to where we're, we're viewing these horrible events, but with just this kind of aloof and humorous prose that really juxtaposes with the things that you're looking at. So just right off the bat. Now, Saloninus, uh, Zara, lo we read these together. Zara loves Saloninus. I like Saloninus as well. I don't love him as much as Basso from The Folding Knife. But Saturninus is this archetypal Parker protagonist. I don't want to say hero because none of them are really heroes, but they, he, Parker excels at this specific kind of protagonist, which is too clever by half, uh, too clever for their own good. They are smarter than everyone around them, and that allows them to be both the masters of their domain, but also ends up being an issue for them when they underestimate the people that they may come across. They usually have some kind of vice, some kind of weakness that ends up being played on, some blind spot that, you know, takes them from out of nowhere. And what I really like about Saloninus, Saloninus is probably the most brilliant uh, Parker protagonist that I've read. More than he's, he's probably smarter than Basso, smarter than, than the other protagonists that I've read. Now, I haven't read any of Parker's series, but I've read several of his novellas and his standalone novels. And the Saloninus of this world is the greatest philosopher that ever, that ever lived. And, and the thing about Saloninus is that he's, he does things to get what he wants, and he does things because he thinks it'll make him money or because he's bored. And so he's, he is this world's Socrates, Plato, all of the, you know, the, the, the Kants, the later philosophers. He, but he's also this, this fabulous playwright. Like, he's, he's this world's Shakespeare and Sophocles and Aeschylus as well. So, Saloninus is narrating this. You don't really get that from him, but everyone else kind of views Saloninus as this, you know, this brilliant just colossal entity of philosophy and the arts because he wrote all this stuff and everyone's like, oh, Saloninus. But the thing is, he's constantly broke and he's constantly on the run from the law 
because he's a criminal. And what I like about Salaninus is that he is an extremely unreliable narrator. He begins telling this in first person, but then switches to third person until we realize that it's still Salaninus, but now he's talking about himself in the third person. And so the conceit of this is that he is on the run from the law because he's, he's because he's on the run from the law because he has he has murdered his wife Eudoxia, who is the sister of his college friend, the prince, and his name is Focus. And this is very similar to the, the, the conceit of Purple and Black, where the main narrator is friends with his college buddy Nico, who is the the emperor in that particular book. And so that that setup right off the bat is similar to the previous novella that I had read, which was Purple and Black. Even though it doesn't play out the same, we do have that similar conceit. In addition to the similar conceit that Sal Salaninus says that Focus is a good ruler because he never wanted to be. And he says those are the only, you can only really be a good ruler if you don't have the desire to be so. And what I like as well about Salaninus' narration is that every time he's, he's going to see a friend, he's going to see a friend from college, Every time he goes to see a friend from college, he's like, oh, this guy's a writer. His friends from college are small-time crooks. His writer friend is a forger, like a counterfeiter. So he, like, counterfeits, you know, fake documents and writes forged documents. And he's got so many of these, these friends, all buddies from college, but they're all, like, small-time crooks. And so the other big connection between Focus and Saloninus is that uh, King Focus is, or Prince Focus, is trying to get Saloninus to devise for him the method of turning lead into gold, base materials into gold. Saloninus is the world's premier alchemist, and he tells Focus like it can't be done, but Focus is like, no, 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 if anybody can do it, you can. And so Saloninus is also trying to run away from this responsibility, and Focus keeps trying to bring him back in, being like, dude, dude, just freaking take my lab, like solve this, this problem for me. And so as the story goes on, we learn more about Focus, we learn more about Saloninus and their time in college, we learn more about Focus's sister, Basso's, not Basso, Saloninus's dead wife, Eudoxia, who is the kind of person who thought that ethics was an excuse for a deficiency in vision and outlook. So Saloninus is like, I don't, I don't want to do that, and she's like, I don't care, just freaking do it. Which, you know, this, this is quintessential Parker in that kind of cynical worldview. The one thing that held me up with this book, because it just, it, it flies as most Parker things do, Saloninus is brilliant, Parker is exceptional at writing characters that you believe are brilliant. What slowed this down one for me is, if you want to know about alchemy and how to turn crap into crap, like, read this book. It walks you through step by step the process, like pages of actual like alchemical formulae where he's adding this to this and why this does this and we don't really know why until later on but he is walking us through it and it just unlike the working inner workings of politics and economics that we saw in the folding knife i'm just not super interested in the inner workings of alchemy and so that kind of weighed it down but the purpose of that and the alchemical kind of backdrop is to show the mutability, really, of all things. How anything can change given the right catalyst and circumstances. And when he talks about his college years, it, ex it especially shows the mutability uh, or the adaptability of social geometry, which all of us can relate to. If you were ever a student, which most of us were, you understand how social geometry can change like that. One day you're on top and you're popular and then all of a sudden one thing happens, a reversal of fortune, and then, uh, look, now you're not the top dog anymore and these friends have gone over here and the groups have split. I'm dealing with something like that right now in my real life. Like most of my friends have, have moved away and the group, the group social geometry that we once had is not really there anymore. And, you know, where do you go from there? Like, I guess I don't have any friends. So, it's probably my fault. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. And so the lead to gold and, and, and gold to lead kind of motif that continues to be experienced in here 
is kind of a metaphor, a stand-in for, for those reversal of fortunes, how lead can become gold and gold can become lead. Just think about how that can apply to any social situation, and, and, and there you go. And so I really, I really, really enjoyed the conclusion of this book. Um, on the Kingfin approval system, I give this, I, I give this one a, a superb minus. I really, really enjoyed it. I like most everything Parker, but I, I enjoyed this, just held back a little by the, al the alchemical descriptions. Um, out of five stars, I gave this one four and a half. Uh, I loved this book. My actual favorite quote from this book, and oh my gosh, does this resonate with me. Salonina says, anyone is capable of infinite achievement as long as it's not the work they're supposed to be doing. Guys, come on. Like, y'all know. Oh my gosh, is that a mood? I can do anything, and I can do anything with aplomb and accomplish whatever I need to do, as long as it's not the crap that I need to be doing. If it's something I need to be doing, well, it's not gonna get done. That's why it's taken me so long to freaking film this. Just the thought of filming these three things together, just talking about them, has just been so overwhelming. But I forced myself to jump in here and not be Salonina's and actually review these freaking books. So book two is the least like the other two. It is the most different of the three, uh, the devil you know. It takes, it has, I think more in common with what I call the Exorcist trilogy, which is Prosper's Demon, The Inside Man, and The Long Game, than it does with the Saloninus books. So Saloninus is in this one, and he is an he is an older he's an older man. He's a man at the end of his life, and I he doesn't feel as much like Saturn. Sal, I, if I have said Saturninus at any point in this, I'm sorry. I teach Latin. I mean Saloninus. So just if I said Saturninus, I mean Saloninus. He feels the least like Saloninus in this one, other than the brilliance, than he does in the other two. But it is definitely the same Saloninus because this one references the events of Blue and Gold. And it's also similar to the Exorcist trilogy in that there are two POVs in this one instead of just the one from Saloninus's perspective in the other two. And one of them is this nameless demon. And he works for the father of lies, Satan, and the whole premise is that this demon is being sent by the father of lies to make this deal with Saloninus. Saloninus wants to make a deal with the devil, essentially, to extend his life so he can finish this great plan he's, he's concocting, but he's, you know, too old to finish. And in return, the return, the devil gets his soul. And that is very similar to the Exodus trilogy. There's this nameless demon, and in Parker's world, the forces of heaven and hell are portrayed as like this bureaucracy where the the demons are just, you know, they're just white collar workers who punch a time clock and go out and, you know, cause mischief and take over this and and do that and it's just their job and some of them don't even like it. That's just what they it's just what they do and they, you know, live forever and it's just it's just kind of their lot in life. And so we have that here as well. He brings a contract and he's very like, the demons are always very cordial when talking to uh, to people. And, and these, if you like discussions of good versus evil, religion's place in, in the world, is there such thing as absolute morality? The exorcist books tend to tackle those themes more than, than these for sure. But in this, they do have a little discussion about is there such thing as good and evil? And they have, and, and they talk about that, no, there isn't. There's only sides and kind of what side you're on. And this is a similar theme that we see in the Exorcist trilogy, which will be review for a different day. Now, despite this being the most different, and despite the fact that I like the Exorcist trilogy less, this is my favorite of the three Saloninus books because of the brilliance of what is happening behind the scenes in this one. I can't give it away, but Saloninus' genius that is behind everything being done is just remarkable to behold. And by the time I'm, I was finished, I was just like, man, Saloninus may be the smartest character I have ever read in any book. And I love Basso. And before Basso is probably the most brilliant character I've ever read. I, Saloninus tops Basso. But it is interesting to watch the back and forth as it switches POV between the Nameless Demon and Saloninus. The back and forth trying to outwit each other. The demon is suspect, thinks that like he knows Saloninus. He's read all of Saloninus' works. He's a fan of Saloninus, really. And he is bound and determined that there is a trick somewhere, that Saloninus is trying to trick him. And Saloninus, you 
admits in like his first POV that he is trying to trick him, but what is the trick? What is being done? And as you try to unravel the mystery, as more is being revealed of what the demon is offering versus what Salonis is getting out of it, the fun, half the fun, uh, is trying to figure out, can you figure it out before the end comes and all is revealed? So I really, really enjoyed this one on the Kingpin Approval System, definitely a superb, and I give this one five out of five stars. And so the third one, the big score, this is probably my least favorite of the three. And part of it is, is because of another similarity in what Parker does a lot. I don't like seeing protagonists succeed and then immediately lose all their, their, their proceeds, which is very common in Parker books, especially the Parker novellas. So Salaninus, we've already seen in, in Blue and Gold, he gets money and then he loses it and has to run because he can't stop being a criminal. So here, this book opens with his, him faking his own death in order to get away with some money that he hid, but he doesn't get it because the person he hid it with stole it. And so once again, Sal we're, we're back at square one from the very beginning. In this one, he runs into a nameless woman who he had an old flame with a long time ago, and she essentially blackmails him into running this one last con, this one thing that's going to be the big score. And so here, where we heard about what a, uh, a crook and small-time criminal Saloninus was in that first book, we just heard about it. Here we get to see it in action, him and this woman plan this major score. And so it also involves, here again is where we see a ton of Saloninus's playwriting skills, and it's referred to earlier in the other books, but here it brings us front and center with this as well. And here it explores Saloninus' desire to just be done with it. Like, he faked his own death because he wanted to just be able to take that money and go retire and not be on, run, on the run from, you know, any law enforcement that is mad at him or anybody he's screwed over. He just wants to retire. He doesn't want anybody to know who he is. He doesn't want to give any autographs. He doesn't want to be commissioned to write something. The man just wants to have a life where nobody knows him and just a quiet, peaceful life. And here, where in the, the last book he was matching wits with the Nameless Demon. Here he is matching wits with a woman who knew him when they were younger and who was aware of all of his tricks and the things he might try. So even as he tries to get out of this job, she finds ways to back him back into it. And so we don't know if there's going to be a double cross, a triple cross, a quadruple cross. We don't know if, if Salonidas is going to take this on purpose to get her arrested and maybe he's arrested as well as they try to do this one last big, this big con uh, so that they can get what is called the big score. And I can't talk about the way it wraps up because, you know, that will spoil things and reveal things, but I just, I, I think I liked Saloninus the least in this one. He's kind of almost pathetic in this one. He just, he, I just, I just did not like, I don't like seeing protagonists, like characters that I like, being strong-armed and manipulated. So I just didn't like seeing him in this in this just sad position. So I think that might be why I liked this one uh, the least, but it does offer that fresh insight on uh, Salonis's playwright and him matching wits with someone who knows him on a on an, an intimate basis more than kind of knows him from a distance having studied him like the nameless demon in The Devil You Know. So out of, uh, on the Kingfin approval system, I gave this one, I think, an excellent plus and four and a half stars. I enjoyed it less than Blue and Gold, but I did enjoy it. And it is a four and a half star because even the Parker books that I don't enjoy as much as the other ones are still just the way he writes and his description of themes and uh, it's just, it's just brilliant. So if you have not read Parker, Blue and Gold's a, a good place to start. It's not my favorite place to start, but if you just want to dip your toes in a novella, Blue and Gold is available as a separate novel as opposed to being in the novella collection like Purple and Black is. Purple and Black is, is my favorite novella uh, by far that I've read. So guys, that is it for me uh, for today. Hopefully this was okay. Hopefully you enjoyed, if there's anybody still listening by the end of this point, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this kind of three brief uh, reviews for a sing for 
you know, a novella collection, if you will. I will be back with to to kind of do the same thing with the Exorcism trilogy that I liked. I liked less overall than the 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 Salaninus ones. One criticism of Parker is that he does a, he has similar tricks that he pulls from his bag, but they're never really used in the exact same way. And the tricks that he uses, the the well that he draws from, happens to be a whole bunch of things that I really like, for the most part. The whole like, oh, I'm on top of the world now, I've lost it all. I don't like that. I don't. I don't. I don't like that. I wish you would stop doing that. But I think Parker's brilliant. You should definitely, definitely read him if you haven't yet. Uh, again, that's all for me for today. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description. And I'll see you next time, guys. Thank you.